Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tennis Coach Diaries. In this video, I'm gonna cover some of the things that I've been working on with my players at the tennis club. I'm gonna talk about a conversation that I had with one of my best buddies who's recently got his player into the top 100 in the world. And finally, I'm gonna talk through my experience of watching Federer play live last week. Now these videos aren't gonna be highly edited or polished. It's simply me having a conversation with you as I drive to work. They're not gonna be replacing my weekly Saturday YouTube videos. I'm gonna be posting these videos in between those now and again, anytime something really interesting happens in my life as a tennis coach, or anytime I feel that I can add value to you as a player, coach, or parent. So first of all, let's talk about meeting and watching Roger Federer. Now, I've been fortunate enough to watch Roger play live at a couple of events, but this was very, very different. Normally, when you watch Federer, there's a huge crowd, the atmosphere is incredible, but this was in Berlin at the Labour Cup venue the week before the Labour Cup was due to start and there was a handful of people in there, Wilson staff and media and press and that sort of thing, but the arena was empty. And as Roger walked in, there was a tiny ripple of applause, but even though the atmosphere of the crowd was pretty dead, Roger had this incredible aura around him. But anyway, once he got hitting, um, the first few balls that he hit, he hit very, very gently. Um, he was hitting with a couple of junior players and he was rolling the ball into the court. And for at least two or three minutes, he was smiling. His grin was going from ear to ear and you could just see the joy that he felt just from simply being on court and hitting balls again. I'm sure he's probably hit balls since his retirement, but you can just see how happy this made him. During his hit, he was so stylish, so smooth, as you can expect from Roger Federer. Um, his timing looked impeccable, even though he's not been hitting very much. But there were two big things that I noticed that helped me to realize that he is human. Um, and so I thought I'd share with you as well. Number one is he was panting. He had a microphone on, so when he was hitting balls, maybe five or ten minutes in he was out of breath now yes he was talking um, into his microphone while he was playing so that doesn't help but um, he actually said that he felt out of shape so that's one thing to know that Roger Federer is human the second thing was even though he was timing the ball pretty well 99% of the time and looking super smooth and stylish like he does he shanked a few shots he missed a few shots in the net and he was actually talking about how he was struggling to see the ball due to the, the lighting in the arena. And um, another sign that he is human, like us. Um, but you cannot take away his playing style. The way that he strikes the ball, I'm not gonna use the, the word effortless as we all know how much effort he put into his playing, but how gracious he looked on the court. Yeah, just phenomenal. But anyway, I said that I met him. It was a very, very brief encounter. Well, two encounters actually. The first was during his hit, he went to pick up a ball near the net. And as I said, the crowd was pretty dead. It was, it was silent, you could hear a pin drop. Um, and there was minimal interaction between him and the crowd. So I kind of wanted to, Pick that up a little bit. So when he came to the net, um, I said this. Looking good, Rog. Hey, feeling okay? <laughs> and he just, and he smiled oh, and replied. This was intense, and, this was um, intense. <laughs> yeah, just that tiny interaction that I had with him made my day. But after the session, um, he came over to take a group photo and he got very close to me and I had my camera in my hand and I said, Roger, can I have a picture? He came over, put his hand on my shoulder. We had a selfie. Um, the guy that was with me was filming. He was from ProDirect. He just about managed to get his um, camera out to video what happened. Um, and just as he stopped recording, Federer turned back to me, looked me in the eye and shook my hand and said, so nice to meet you. And um, it was the most brief of encounters. But for me, being a huge Federer fan, it was a very special moment. But um, yeah. Let me know in the comments below if you've ever had an encounter with a professional tennis player. Let me know who it was and what they were like, because I'm always intrigued to hear what these players are like off court. 
But yeah, moving on to the second thing that I wanted to talk about. So I had a really long phone call with one of my best buddies, Ben Reeves. Now, you may have seen me post on here before about Ben, as he is the coach of British tennis player Sonny Cartel. Now, I made a series of videos during Wimbledon a couple of years back when Sonny got to play her very first main draw at Wimbledon as a wildcard player. And um, Sonne is the same age as Emma Raducanu. She grew up playing through her junior years with Emma. They often played in the national finals and had really good matches. So they were very, very similar level. And um, since Emma's huge win at the US Open, obviously her ranking shot up and Sonne's ranking was much, much more gradual increase. Sonne and Ben spent a couple of years playing in the Futures Tour, playing in lots of 15 and 25K events, gradually increasing her ranking. And anyway, fast forward to today, she's just broken into the world's top 100, which is no mean feat. One of the most difficult things to do as when you're playing in these lower level pro events, the rankings, points and prize money that's on offer is minimal. And so you really have to get a ton of wins under your belt um, to, to break into that top 100. So a huge achievement for Sonne and her coach Ben um, and super fortunate to be you know, best buddies with Ben as we did our level three coaching course together. So I know him very, very well and spent a lot of time um, in my kind of late teens and early 20s, um, you know, chatting with Ben about the players that we're working with. You might have seen I posted about Hannah Smith, um, who was another player that was around that age group with Sonne and Emma. And so, you know, as I was working with Hannah and Ben was working with Sonne, we'd always share things that we were working on, footage of our players so that we could help each other out with technical pointers and that sort of thing. So, um, Really fortunate to, um, to know Ben, great guy, amazing coach. Um, and I'm gonna get him onto the channel to have a little bit of an interview with him and Sonny. But anyway, the conversation we were having was about life on tour um, and how tough it is. But we got into the topic of how he actually helped Sonny to get into the top 100 because it takes a very specific skill to work with a player at pro level and a very different skill in my opinion to develop a young junior player to get to that level um, and this is why when you look at all of the players in the top 100 it's very 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 rare that you see a player working with a coach that they've worked with since their childhood Ben and Sonne have been working with each other since they were she was six or seven years old a couple of things that he said which really resonated with me that might be useful for you is number one one of the keys is that ben tries to help his players to have a very advanced understanding of the basics rather than having a very basic understanding of the advanced and what he meant by that was there are a lot of players and coaches out there that try to be too clever in their ways and they try to you know work on super advanced skills but don't really ever get a chance to master them whereas if you can develop the basics and become excellent at the basics you're going to be pretty hard to beat and going a little bit deeper into that Ben said that he spent years and years with Sonne working on making balls. It sounds simple, but if you can get one more ball in than your opponent, you win the point. And if you can do that time and time again, you win the match. But yeah, I just thought that was a really simple um, and useful way of thinking about skill acquisition. Anyway, so relating that conversation to my philosophy as a tennis coach. You may have realized that when I make my YouTube videos, I don't often go very deep into the technical elements of strokes. The reason being is a lot of technical work that I do with my players is very personal to them. And in tennis, 
it's very rarely one size fits all. If I'm working with a player on a certain technical element on their serve, it may not work for you in the way that you're built physically, in the way that you play with your game style. And so I think it's dangerous as somebody who's making coaching videos online to make a video that could impact your game negatively. What I try to do with my videos is give you things that are non-negotiables, things that every player should work on to develop their game. And generally speaking, that is more about the mental side of things, the tactical and the physical side of things as well. And when I do talk about technique, I'm always really conscious that I add context. However, there are some technical areas that I could cover in a YouTube video. What I was thinking was potentially talking through the checkpoints on the serve, as when we look at serve technique, there are tons of stylistic things that we could change, but there are some key checkpoints that all of us need to follow no matter what our technique looks like. One of them being the misconception that most people have about the racket drop. Um, I've been working with a couple of players in the last week on their racket drop. And the biggest misconception is when players watch a pro serving in slow motion and they see that racket drop happening, they try to copy it in their own service action. But the problem is when you try to copy the racket drop, you start to manipulate the racket using your arm. You'll use your wrist and your elbow to get that racket to drop. Whereas the fact of the matter is that racket drop is a reaction. It's a reaction of you using your legs to drive your hips and to rotate into the serve. That will create that racket lag, which is what gets the racket to drop. So I can't really go much deeper than that. Sat in my car. I'll probably need to get out on court with a racket to show you. But let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to cover um, a little bit more around serve mechanics. But also I think I could cover the kinetic chain as a whole. Talking about how to use the ground more effectively to generate more power on your shots. So again, if that's something that would interest you, let me know in the comments below. And finally, as I mentioned about Ben and Sonne, I have arranged with them a time to get onto court during one of their practice sessions and to kind of go through a bit of a, an informal interview with them. So if you have any questions for Ben or Sonne, drop a comment below. Thanks as always for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care.